Well, today the message I'm bringing to you is on the topic of biblical sexuality. It was a, a year ago, almost to the day, when the laws of our land were put into effect, the so-called conversion therapy ban, where it is unlawful for someone who is a, a counselor or even a parent or a pastor to seek to persuade someone to embrace the gender, the sex that they were born in. Biblical sexuality, what is, has been called traditional sexuality, God's creational norm, what has been standard for all time in all places across humanity, has been deemed by our government to be harmful and dangerous to society. The Bible is relegated as a myth and a harmful stereotype. And those who would seek to convert those away from the LGBTQ lifestyle or, or, or way can face fines and even imprisonment. And so last year, a number of us, on the day when that law came into effect, we decided, well, we will preach on that subject and we will call people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because while we have a law in our country which says it is illegal for us to seek to convert someone from that way of life into the way that God has made them, we recognize we have another law written by the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And he says, preach Christ, preach salvation, preach repentance, preach judgment, Warn sinners about the judgment to come. Preach how God has made them male and female. Preach about biblical sexuality. And so I'm here today to preach what our king has called us to preach. My goal today is threefold. I want to expose the ideas that really underlie this new sexual ethic that is ubiquitous across our country, and around the Western world. What are the ideas underlying that? Secondly, I want to remind us that the wages or the consequence of sin is death. And then thirdly, I will call us to see Christ as our mighty Savior and find joy and delight in Him. So with your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. One verse will be our focus here this morning. Romans 6, 23. The word of God says here, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to first focus on the first part of Romans 6, 23, when it says the wages of sin is death. When the Bible talks about sin, it's talking about what is a, a perversion, what is a distortion, an upturning, a defilement of God's order, of God's righteousness, of God's standards. Uh, if your children are learning the children's catechism, they will learn what is sin. Sin is failing to do what God commands. God has given his law, which is an expression. It's not just some law outside of himself is willy-nilly. I just think these are good ideas. But rather the law is an expression of who he is. We are not to lie because God is true. We are not to be adulterers and unfaithful because God is always faithful. And so the law is an expression of God's own character. And sin is a, a deformation, a perversion, a rejection of God's righteousness and of his order. And this text that we're looking at today says the wages of sin is death. Now the scripture here uses a metaphor of wages, what you earn, and it's mean to bring to, it means to bring to mind to us you working a job in a vocation, you know, you, you spend a week working for someone and then you earn a wage. It is what you deserve. And so you don't get to work a week for someone and then they give you a paycheck in that week and you're like, wow, you're so gracious of you. To give me this money, I don't deserve it at all. It's like, no, you deserve that. That's what you earn because you worked and so you receive 
this money as a wage. What the scriptures say here is that sin pays a wage. There is something owing to you because of the services you render to sin. In other words, if you give your life to sin, what, will, what you earn, what you deserve, what will come back to you ultimately is death. That's the consequence of sin. The consequence of sin is death. Our world today says, well, if you give yourself to sin, you'll have fun and you'll have joy and, and everything go well with you. But you don't get an early retirement. You don't get a bonus or a raise when you give your life to sin. Rather, you get death. He's talking here, not only or not primarily in this passage about what God would render to you. He's not saying here that if you are a sinner, then God will judge you and that judgment will be death. What the scriptures are talking about here is that sin itself will pay you back. And that sin will birth in you death. And for that, look at verse number 20 in Romans 6. It says there, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Another metaphor of fruit here. And so the fruit you get from giving your life to sin is not only shame, but the end of that is death. So he's not referring here to God's judgment. He's referring here about the, the natural consequence in God's order of giving your life to sin, how that will reap back to you a fruit that is bitter and po poisonous and that will lead to your death. The same thing we see in James chapter one. You don't need to turn there, but listen as I read from verse 14 and 15. It says there, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Here's another picture. Picture of wages, a picture of fruit, and now here, a picture of birth, how desire conceives and gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it grows and matures, it brings death. And so scripture is so clear that the consequence of sin is sorrow, is misery, is pain, is destruction, and ultimately death. This is why it has been famously been said by the Puritan John Owen, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Sin's desire is to destroy you. Sin's desire is your death, the destruction of everything good in God's creation. Now there's an example in Romans chapter 1 of the destruction, destructive consequence of sin. And in Romans chapter 1, it describes those who in their unrighteousness suppress the truth and they worship idols. They worship the creation rather than the creator. And then it describes how God in his judgment removes his hands from the wheel, so to speak, lets them have the consequence of their sin. And then it speaks about sexual immorality. It speaks about men committing perverse acts with other men and women likewise, exchanging natural relations and being with other women. It's talking about homosexuality as a symptom of God letting sin run its course and bringing destruction and death. And this is what we see in our society today. That sin breeds death. Now just like Romans 1 talks about the root issue of sin. In other words, the homosexuality mentioned in Romans 1 is not the, the judge or not going to be the cause for God's judgment. It is the result of God's judgment. It is the effects of, of sin running its course. And corrupting and destroying God's good creation. And it begins in Romans chapter 1 with a suppression of the truth. And with a, with a worshiping of the creation rather than worshiping the creator. And what I want to do is 
try to get more particular and to diagnose some of those root sins and ideas that are behind the, the new sexual ethic that is in our world today. Because likely if you were to, in your grandparents' generation, have someone come to your grandparents when they were, you know, in the prime of life. And someone come to, a man come to your grandparents and say, I am a woman trapped in a man's body. What would your grandparents say? They, they, they wouldn't know what to say. What are you talking about? They, they wouldn't have a category for that. They would think you're an alien coming from another planet or like what, I, I hear words coming out of your mouth, but they don't compute. What do you mean? But today, if someone says, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa, everyone's like, oh yeah. And, and we acknowledge that and we seek to affirm them in that. So what has changed? What has, what are these underlying ideas of our society that we have embraced that have led us to think this is reasonable now in our day and age? Now, these are not meant to be exhaustive, but a few of the major ones. And so there are a few ideas that have gained prominence, prominence in our day to make something like homosexuality, like transgenderism, and, and all the other letters and what they stand for, why it makes them possible, even probable. Number one is the idea that man, that mankind, is a sexual man. This idea gained prominence in the 60s and 70s with a sexual revolution. The idea that, that man, mankind, humanity, that our, our goal is the pursuit of happiness and that happiness is found as, as we throw off the, the shackles of, a, of yesteryear and as we pursue happiness and primarily as we pursue sexual happiness. That sexual liberation is the key to make you happy. And so man is defined as, as a sexual being and his pursuit of happiness is through the avenue of sexual relations. And then we'll find joy. Now this is not only what was in popular culture, but even have people like Sigmund Freud very influential, writing that the purpose of life and the content of the good life is personal sexual fulfillment. Now, not everyone in our society is reading Freud and coming to the same conclusions. But we have movies and television and media and education and other influencers have all affirmed this message. That monogamy, that chastity, that um, marriage are all hindrances to your happiness, to your joy, to your sexual fulfillment. And so, in our culture, we see love and sexual acts regularly pictured divorce from marriage and from faithfulness of, of one man and one woman. Pornography, which is now ubiquitous, has been a key tool in divorcing sex from marriage and procreation to make your happiness and your sexual fulfillment as an end of itself. Of course, this has been made a reality through birth control and abortion. And again, divorce, divorcing sex from marriage, from procreation, from the enjoyment of marriage as God has made it. All these things to separate and to liberate so-called sex so that we might find our joy and fulfillment. This is one of those key ideas that are, that are undergirding our society today that is, that is rarely called into question. Another prominent idea in our day and age, besides the sexual man, is the idea of the psychological man. The psychological man, that we are not only sexual beings, but we are psychological beings. We've seen in this past century the rise of psychology. And what I mean by the rise of psychology is that what is truly real and what is truly authentic is how you feel. It's what's on the inside. And so what you, what you feel is real. Your, your reality is, is governed by your feelings. 
And we even speak that way today. Someone who is truly authentic and, and vulnerable is someone who, who shares their feelings because they're, they're giving us a picture into their inner man, their most core person and who they are. Whereas the Bible says our feelings are not to be our masters, but rather our slaves. That what is real is what God has made, is what is reality, and our feelings can so often lead us astray. But in psychological man, our feelings are the prime reality. That's why we have to have classrooms, which are safe spaces, where your own ideas can't be questioned by reality, where you need to be affirmed and comforted because the inner you is your feelings, and even to hurt your feelings is a great sin today. And this is why hate speech is now a thing today. This is why freedom of, of speech is now being suppressed. Why is that? Because abuse now is not only seen in, in physical harm to someone, but hurting someone's feelings. Because we are a psychological man. That's why we see the ascendancy of the self, the my truth, the my feelings, my self-identity. Who are you to deny me my identity, my pronouns, the way that I perceive myself? Because that is the ultimate explainer of reality. And so we see not only a sexual man, but a psychological man today. Thirdly, we also see this idea of a technological man. A technological man. What I mean by this idea is that in generations past, if there was a a killer virus coming through, if there was a great natural disaster, if there was some kind of cataclysm, uh, whatever it might be, a drought or anything, then people would adapt and and assume that they, they must try to make the best of these circumstances. That this is the providence of God. But today with technological man, we have so improved in our tools and our technology and we're so accustomed to controlling and to manipulating the things that are around us. We have come to the point where we think we can manipulate and control all of creation around us to make it conform to our feelings and to our likeness, to our desires. And so if you feel like a man, but you have a body of a woman, then you can use technology and science in order to change the outward to match the inward. We're going to see increasingly in our day using technology to fulfill your sexual desires as well. Now these ideas, sexual man, psychological man, and technological man, are all streams of thought that explain why the LGBTQ plus movement is so popular today. The the foundations have been laid in these ideas and now this is the, the consequence of those ideas. It also explains, not only because of sexual man or psychological man or technological man, not only why the LGBTQ plus movement is, is possible and prominent, but it also explains why those who advocate for, for it for so strongly are anti-culture, are seeking to tear down what has gone before. Because the Bible clearly denies us as being primarily sexual beings. It denies that we are psychological man, that the, your inward reality is the true reality. It denies that we have the capability to manipulate creation to our whims and pleasures. And so these ideas today then deem Christianity and the truths espoused in the Bible as being against their freedom and against their reality. And so it must destroy Christianity. It must destroy those creational norms. It must attack issues like traditional marriage and the family and sex inside of marriage. These things are deemed bondage and hostile to their ideas of liberation and progress. It also helps us understand why even within the L, G, B, and T, and Q, how those identities are oftentimes contrary to one another. In one sense, we're saying there is no gender. In another sense, someone is changing from one gender into another. 
And so there's, there's internal inconsistencies in that worldview, and yet they're all united together to defeat a common enemy. Ultimately, the Christian faith, because they are rebelling against God and against his creation. And so it is these underlying ideas that are ultimately like what it says in Romans 1, a suppression of the truth and an exchange of the worship of God for the worship of the creation that has given birth to all this manner of sin. And so we might say, well, we'll look at all the sin in our society today and we can unwittingly begin to espouse the views that have led to that sin. We can feel so powerless to, to deal with the, the fruit sins in our society today and never press down deeper into the root issues. And then some Christians wonder, well, how, how did my children grow up and espouse the things of the world? I told them that those things were bad. Well, we might have addressed the fruit, but we never got down to the root of those ideas that are really the suppression of the truth of God and an exchange of the creature with the creator. And so now we see in our society, because of these ideas, a whole host of sinful consequences. Not only is, like it says in Romans 1, is homosexuality a result of, of sin and a demonstration of God's judgment, but then it then leads to death. Just think about all the results of sorrow and misery in our society today that catch headlines all the time. Things like suicide and mental illness. How many articles have you seen that those, these continue to skyrocket, especially among the LGBTQ community because the wages of sin is death. How many times have you heard about relational breakdowns and divisions? Divorce is rampant. Most children today are not raised in a home with a mom and a dad who love one another, but in a dysfunctional home. We see the rise of pornography and all of its social dysfunction that it causes. We see AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. We see depression and a huge dependency on antidepressants continue to grow as being one of the most prescribed drugs in our society today. We have a drug culture along with its many overdoses. We have children who are sexualized and abuse is rampant. We have a society that is increasingly unsafe, especially for children and for women. We're continuing to be told we need more police, more laws, more limitations, more control. Why? Because sin is running rampant and its consequences are rearing its poisonous fruit. We see functioning perfectly healthy bodies going under the knife today in surgeries that mutilate working organs to create something more akin to Frankenstein's monster than a male or a female. We see chemicals who are being used in what benignly is being called puberty blockers, but in fact cause chemical castration and destroy bodies. At its core, sin is irrational and it's a rejection of truth and it's a rejection of God. And it leads to sorrow, to pain, to misery, destruction, and ultimately it leads to death. And yet today, the so-called societal experts are those who so often are those who go to weekly counseling, are on psychiatric medication, are self-professedly broken and abused and relationally a mess. And yet they are the ones who are going to tell us how we ought to run society. Today, the U.S. military is run by men who are dressed up in women's clothing. How is that going to be good for our society? We have men, even our own country, who wear large prosthetic breasts who are in the classrooms of our children teaching them. And we say we cannot interfere with that man's feelings, but we never consider the children that are in that situation and the abuse that they are being put under. We see over and over again the consequences of sin. We see in the scriptures that Adam and Eve did not believe God. And of course that led to sorrow and misery. The whole creation fell into death. The people before the flood, they despised Noah's warning. And what was the consequence? Sorrow and death. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, for all their lusting after sexual pleasure, 
what was the consequence? Sorrow and death. The people of Israel would not enter the promised land and do what God had commanded. And what was the consequence? Sorrow and death. We see people today who are devoted to define man as a sexual man, define man as a psychological man, as a technological man. But what will be the end of these root sins? It'll be sorrow, misery, and death. The wages of sin is death. Now, as we consider this phrase, the wages of sin is death. As I mentioned, we can feel so very powerless today. And what ought we to do about this? Especially if you are parents and you have children growing up in this. How can we help protect our children from what is going on today? What I want to do is ask you a, a number of questions at this point. To evaluate where you are in terms of some of these prevailing ideas in our society today. Almost like a self-test. And I'll give you a warning now. The questions will get harder as you go along. So we'll start with an easy one. But the, the point of these questions is to see. Are we unwittingly espousing these root ideas that undergird this sexual revolution that we see happening today? Such that we can identify some bad fruit, but we don't recognize a bad tree that is producing that bad fruit. And so unwittingly, we have these bad trees in our garden and they will bear bad fruit. So the first question is this. How would you define marriage? How would you define marriage? Should be a simple question. We've heard this a lot today. There's a debate about what's, go what's going on. What is true marriage? How would you define marriage? What are the things that you think would be essential to a marriage and that a marriage needs and then without that you don't really have a marriage? Would your definition of marriage include lifelong companionship? Would your definition of marriage Include sexual intimacy and satisfaction? Would your definition of marriage include procreation as a necessary element of marriage? Now, I know at this point, some would say, well, you can't include procreation as a part of marriage because I know people who are married who can't have children and they're really married. That exception actually proves the rule. What the Bible holds forth is that marriage is a lifelong companionship. That it is a place where there is sexual intimacy and fulfillment. And that it is a place that leads to the procreation, the producing of children. This is the definitional of marriage. But it's that last point where marriage includes procreation that most Christians today would say, uh-uh, you've gone too far. Even though our most ancient creeds and confessions that touch on this issue include procreation as part of marriage. Even though it's been traditional in our culture before the last number of decades, that has been part of the definition of marriage. And so why are so many hesitant to include that when we think about marriage? It's because we've been influenced by the divorcing of sex from marriage and of children from marriage. Here's another question for you. How would you answer if someone asked you this? What's wrong if two consenting people love one another and just are living together or married together? What's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong in your community if you had two guys down the street who love one another, mutually consenting, and they live together? What harm to you would their relationship bring? Why would you object to that? Why is that a problem? They love one another. They're consenting. Many people have had a hard time answering this question. Christians and non-Christians. Who seek to advocate for the idea of marriage between one man and one woman. As you think about that, let me share with you how I would answer this. Two, two ways in which I would answer it. The first is this. A relationship between two men or two women that is not a biblical marriage. 
a marriage according to God's creational norms, is against the design of God and is ultimately a defacing of the image of God and man. To start there, it's against God's design and it's actually reprehensible to God. It's a defacing, it's, a, it's like graffiti on the wall to God's image. Now you can picture someone going to a wall you know, in town and, and throwing paint on that or using spray paint, paint to, to graffiti some message on there. It'd be awful. But now imagine that same act of putting paint on the wall is done to a, a one-of-a-kind painting by Michelangelo or da Vinci. Suddenly that graffiti has just elevated in its severity because of the image that it defaced. And the same is true, not only when you destroy a, a masterpiece, is it an egregious sin, but it also is an attack ultimately on the master who made that piece. To deny and to subvert and to reject and to live outside of God's creational norms is ultimately a defacing of God's image, of God's design. It's ultimately an attack against God. And so the severity of that sin is very great. Now, someone might say, well, it's my body, it's my choice. I'm not hurting anybody. But the second thing I would say is not only is an attack against God, but it's also destructive to humanity. There is no private sin. What happens in the bedrooms of our nations affects our nation. It's a lie to say that it doesn't. Going against God's design is destructive to humanity. For this, imagine a man who is in his backyard. And this man is a lazy man. And his yard has lots of weeds. And they're beginning to grow and the neighbor beside him looks over his fence and says, Hey neighbor, your yard is an eyesore. Can you cut back those weeds? And he's like, no, this is it's my yard. I can do with it what I want. I'm not hurting anybody. You can keep your yard nice and clean and I'll keep my yard the way it is. We all know what's going to happen. In a few months, those weeds grow and they come to seed. Now those seeds are blown everywhere over the community. Spreading that those weeds and that sin everywhere. No longer is it just an eyesore, but now it's like a cancer. And with it, it's spreading its death and decay. There is no private sin. When you think about gay marriage or transgenderism or other sexual perversions, they are not innocent nor harmless. Obvious is the children who are exposed to such ideas who are in those relationships, who are in the schools, who see it displayed in public, they are planting seeds to corrupt the minds of these children. To grow forth in their minds perversity and, and what is twisted and what is deformed according to what God has made and according to what we see so plainly in the created world around us. We know how powerful an example is we know how hard it is for young men to grow up today when there are so few examples of real men. So few examples of manhood and womanhood today because the examples we have today continue to poison the minds of the children of the next generation. And so these sins are not only against the design of God, but they're destructive to humanity. That's how I would answer that question about what is it to you that people live that way? Ultimately, it's against God, and ultimately, it's an attack against humanity. Now, the third question I want to ask you, and again, I mentioned these are going to get harder. And this one's going to get more personal. Because it's one thing to seek to identify the consequences of sin out there, and then be ignorant with the consequences of sin in here and in here. So my third question by way of diagnosis is how is your sin in your life destructive? What are the things that you have seen in your home, in your workplace, in your marriage, among your siblings, before your parents, among your neighbors, among those at church? What are the things that you have seen in your life that are a consequence of the destructive nature of sin. 
We're here today because we're here to hear from God's word. Because we know we're sinners and we need the salvation that only Jesus Christ can offer us. And we know the wages of sin is death. The consequence of sin is pain and sorrow and misery and destruction leading to death. And so as sinners, we ought to be able to look at our lives and see, oh, the consequence of sin. And so do you see that in your life? Sin's destructive effect? How are your relationships? Are they a source of joy and comfort and encouragement and strength? Or has sin produced division and brokenness? Is the, is, is the yard nice and manicured? Or is there lots of weeds that continue to sprout forth seeds of destruction? I've had the opportunity more than one occasion to witness the sins of a husband and father destroy his home. I've had the opportunity to see the sins of a wife and a mother destroy her home. I've seen the sins of a child destroy and break their parents' hearts. I've seen sin destroy churches. Sin is destructive. And so how is your life? Is, is there destruction? Is there pain? Is there misery? Is there brokenness that would indicate there is a problem of sin there? The danger for us is that we continue to sow seeds of sin. And we continue to give ourselves to those root issues that are causing sin in our life. And we can say, well, well, this lust is bad and this anger is bad and this bitterness is bad. But yet we're not dealing with the root issues that continue to produce those, that rotten fruit in our life. There's a number of things that we continue to feast our eyes on. And I'm speaking generally as Christians and as churches. It's no secret that pornography is rampant in the church today. It's no secret that entertainment will be set before our eyes. It fuels idolatry and rebellion. And yet we enjoy it. That rather than beholding the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ so often... Christians can set there before their eyes the, the evils of this world and drink in this sin. And that rather than beholding Christ and being transformed from one degree of glory to another, we're brought down from one degree of corruption to another. I want to read to you a quote. This is from Augustine when he wrote his Confessions. And he describes a friend of his who was seeking to, leave a moral, seeking to lead a moral and pure life. And his friends were ribbing him on and, and calling him to come and watch the, the gladiators. And he was determined that if I go there, I will not be influenced by this bloodbath. This is evil. This is immoral. This is wretched. I will not go there. And I will not enjoy it if I do go there. Well, his friends convince him to go. And Augustine writes this. When they arrived and had found seats where they could, the entire place seethed with the most monstrous delight in the cruelty. Speaking about his friend, he says, He kept his eyes shut and forbade his mind to think about such fearful evils. Would that he had blocked his ears as well. A man fell in combat. A great roar from the entire crowd struck him with such vehemence that he was overcome by curiosity. Supposing himself strong enough to despise whatever he saw and to conquer it, he opened his eyes. He was struck in the soul by a wound graver than the gladiator in his body whose fall had caused the roar. The shouting entered by his ears and forced open his eyes. Thereby it was the means of wounding and striking to the ground a mind still more bold than strong and the weaker for the reason that he presumed on himself when he ought to have relied on you. As soon as he saw the blood, 
He at once drank in savagery and did not turn away. His eyes were riveted. He imbibed madness. Without any awareness of what was happening to him, he found delight in the murderous contest and was inebriated by bloodthirsty pleasure. He was not now the person who had come in. This is a description of what delighting in sin, of what putting immorality, of ungodly ideas and idolatries before our mind's eyes. And when this comes in, it changes us. Sin is destructive. The wages of sin is death. And the temptation not only do we have in in delighting in sinful things around us, but then when we see the destruction and brokenness in our lives, in our marriages, our relationships, whatever they might be, we then we get we get more angry or more more passionate about the consequences of our sin rather than the sin itself. We get more angry at the brokenness in our lives and we begin to get angry at God. Why have you done this? We begin to be angry at those around us that are perhaps sinning against us and we're sinning against them and it's caused destruction. And so we get angry at this, but we never get angry at our anger, at our lust, at our pride, at our lack of humility. We never get angry and grow in hatred towards our sin. We get moved more by the affliction our sin caused than by our sin itself. Sin is a great darkness. It's destructive. It's wages is death. It ruins lives, homes, and societies. And the lie today is that more sin will fix your sin problems. It will lead you further and further down into despair and darkness. This is why the Bible says the wages of sin is death. At this point, as we're reminded of our sin, we find ourselves crying out, who will save us from this bitter pill? Who can deliver us from the power of sin and from its wage? And this passage says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We spend a lot of time looking at the the wages of sin and how that leads to despair and corruption and ultimately death. And here, the the contrast is the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the one who comes to deliver from sin, to rescue from sin. To heal not only the brokenness that sin causes, but also the, the root issues that have led to all the brokenness and the pain and the misery. And so Jesus Christ comes to this earth to take on the wage of sin himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He became sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The wages of sin is death, and so Jesus came to, to die. And by taking on that penalty himself, by drinking the full cup of God's wrath, and then rising again three days later to demonstrate that sin has been conquered, that it's debt what we earn because of our sin, that has been paid in him. Victorious. And it says here that what he gives is contrasted with sin because with sin you earn death. And Jesus came and takes what we rightly earn, what we rightly deserve, death. And what he gives to us is not what we rightly earn or what we merit, but it's a free gift. The word here for free gift is the same word that we get grace from, same root. This is God's grace. It's, a, it's unmerited. It's undeserved. He's come to give you grace. He's come to give you favor that you did not deserve. This is free. You did not work for this. You deserve death because that sin's wage. But in comes Christ and here comes this free gift. And this gift is eternal life. This gift is forgiveness. This gift is is reconciliation with God, your creator, whom you have profaned and denied and rebelled against. This gift includes not only reconciliation with God, but the the restoration of all things. He's going to wipe away your tears and comfort your sorrows, give you new bodies. 
Everything will be made right in the Lord Jesus Christ because of his grace. And so as you consider this passage, even as sin has been exposed, not only in the world, but in our own lives, the question is, do we recognize and do we have this free gift of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Do you find yourself, when you are struck by your sin and struck by the mercy and grace of God, do you find yourself moved to tears? Has that ever happened to you? So broken by your sin, with tears of sorrow, and so moved by the love of Christ that you have tears of joy? You know the Lord Jesus Christ weeps for sinners like us? When he looked at Jerusalem, he he wept. Here are people without a shepherd. Here are people who are lost. Who are people who are sinners and who need a mighty Savior. So if you find you can't weep for your own sin or weep for joy in the Lord Jesus Christ, know that he weeps for sinners. He prays for sinners. Now some may be thinking, well, I'm I'm too far gone for Christ to save me. Too hardened in my sin. Too far down that hole. Well, are you a sinner? Because Christ came for sinners. And he's a mighty savior. There's no sin that is too far gone for the Lord Jesus Christ not to deliver. And sin's desire is to to drag us down, to grab hold of us, and to, to bring us down to the depths of hell. Then Christ comes to break the bonds of sin and to raise us up with him in eternal life. So the question for us is, will we trust Christ? Will we confess our sin? Confess the brokenness and the misery and the pain that is caused and come to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, your free gift is what I need. And so I confess my sin before you and I trust you that you are the mighty savior and I'm yours now. I'm going to forsake my sin and and live for you. That's the right response to this free gift that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to end with this. Because this free gift is not just for the future. Not just for all of eternity. But the healing that the Lord Jesus Christ brings to the sinner. This eternal life begins when you believe upon Christ. Christ. Eternal life is to know God and to know his son whom he has sent. And that eternal, that abundant life begins when you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That fullness of life starts now. And let me share some of those things that are a contrast to the the weeds and the bitter fruit of sin that produces in your life. In Christ, in this fullness of life, Christ places you into a community of faith. It is here in the context of the church that we follow Christ's commands and that we love him, we grow in our love for him and that we love one another and grow in our love for one another. That we continue to grow and fight against our sin and pursue holiness and righteousness before our Lord Jesus Christ. This community of faith is meant to be a brotherhood, a family that is tighter than any blood relationship. This is what Christ is building, what he promised the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. And he's building his bride and will come back for his bride. It'll be a great and glorious day when he does so. Christ is building his church. Also, Christ is redeeming and restoring marriage and family. It's important for us to recognize that marriage and family is right at the very beginning and also at the very end. And that when Christ redeems and restores He's redeeming and restoring even now the Christian home. It is here that sexual desires find their end, find their fulfillment. It is in a marriage, in a family that you find the intimacy of self-giving, of commitment, of true and deep love that leads to great joy. Just compare the embrace you receive from someone that you know so very deeply versus that of a stranger. So it's more meaningful. And so the sexual desires that God has given 
finds its true fulfillment and true joy in a committed marriage relationship. And in their children are seen as a blessing rather than a blight. And the Christian home becomes the refuge and pillar to weather the storms of this age. Christ is building Christian homes. And thirdly and finally, Christ established us in truth rather than in feeling and fantasy. What Christ is doing is not only building a community of faith, not only is he establishing homes and marriages, but Christ is also establishing us in truth rather than us being governed by our feelings or by fantasies. And this is where it's important to realize there is such comfort in being a creature living in God's world as opposed to you being in the fantasy of your mind living according to your feelings and trying to Change all of creation to match what you feel. Christ establishes us in the truth. As I said before, feelings are terrible masters. And it's important, I want to speak to you, to you young men especially, the boys, the young men, that you learn not to simply be a man of feeling, to wear your feelings on your shirt. That's not authentic, it's embarrassing. It's a lack of self-control and lack of dignity to give vent to your feelings. But it's in Christ that our feelings are set aright. It's in Christ that we are to put away all anxiety and fear and to live as if he is the great God who loves us and bestows upon us dignity and honor and value and worth. And then to live forth with confidence and boldness and courage in this day and age. In Christ, we have strength. In Christ, we have confidence and joy. Augustine famously said, You stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. This is seen also in Psalm 34, verse 8, where it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And so the the solution to combating these false ideas like sexual man and psychological man or technological man is to see that our, our joy and fulfillment is found in God and in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That it's found in, in living in a community, the church. It's found in, in building Christian homes. It's, it's found in living according to the truth and in righteousness rather than in feelings and fantasy. We might be thinking, well, that's... That's good and all, but that's kind of, it seems so very powerless compared to all the ideas that are so pervasive in our society today. Well, when the early church was born, they were in an empire that deemed Christianity as morally repugnant, intellectually unbelievable. And yet, in a few centuries, it became the dominant religion of the empire. So how did they do that? And it wasn't primarily through slick ads on television, stunning movies and things like that. It was through churches who gathered together to worship the great God in spirit and in truth. Who were places of righteousness, who sought to give themselves to the obedience of scripture and to be that community of faith that Jesus Christ is building. It was through marriages that were otherworldly. We had husband and wife come together, love one another, and they would pour into their children who would grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It was through a group of people who would live according to the truth and would not succumb to the lies, the feelings, and the fantasies of the society around them. Even willing to give their lives for the truth. And because of the church, because of Christian families, because of standing upon the truth, they, by the power of the Spirit, by their witness, they changed the world. This is our calling. This is our task. We must be wary of that bitter and poisonous fruit and the root that has brought it about and then live as Christ followers in the church, in our homes, according to his truth. So let us trust Christ. Let us be salt and light in this world. Love him, serve him, and faithfully follow after him because he is worthy. Let's pray.